I'm Enrico Gruen, and this is Second Nature. Greetings down there on Earth, all you prisoners of gravity. This is Commander Rick interrupting the airwaves. As you may remember, the last time I overrode this TV signal, I talked all about memory, but I totally forgot about amnesia. Now, one of the finest SF stories about amnesia is Philip K. Dick's terrifying novella, We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, written in 1966, if memory serves me. Oh, well, you may remember the movie version, Total Recall, a megabuck special FX extravaganza starring Arnold the Terminator Schwarzenegger. Personally, I blocked it out. But did you know that David Cronenberg was hired to write and direct the movie? Nancy, open a line to Toronto, please. Cronenberg's version of the story was rejected by the film's producers. Too bad they didn't choose Mind Over Splatter. Ah, David, it's Rick. I wanted to ask you about your adaptation of We Can Remember It For You Wholesale. What were you hoping to say about memory and amnesia with your treatment? Oh, well, I did 12 drafts of Total Recall, 12, over, uh, over the period of a year, and trying to come up with something that I really wanted to do uh, that would also satisfy Dino De Laurentiis and Ron Chusset, who were the two producers involved in it. And really, I guess it was a hopeless case from the beginning because what I wanted to do was, as Ron Chusset said, the Philip K. Dick version. And that's not what they wanted to do. <laughs> when he said that, I said, well, isn't that what we're here to do? And he said, no. Um, he really wanted it to be something like Raiders of the Lost Ark go to Mars. And, of course, the reason that the project was so fascinating to a lot of directors was because the first third, the basic premise, was fantastic and fascinating. But it was also very dark in its implications about human identity and memory. Right. And uh, that's what I wanted to do, to draw out the implications of that. And uh, no one had ever managed to do this, the middle third and the last third. And, and I thought, well, I, I think I could do it. And I thought I did do it in the script. The uh, producers didn't want to do that version. And uh, I said, well, the Philip K. Dick version is kind of really what I want to do. So um, it's too bad it took us a year to find out we were talking about two different movies. And I thought that's when I left the project. What would you have done differently from the way it came out in the Schwarzenegger blockbuster? Well, you're asking me now to psych back into something that I'm sure I've deliberately repressed. But I can tell you that you won't find it in the existing version of the movie Total Recall. Uh, the mere casting of Arnold Schwarzenegger meant that the entire premise of the film was destroyed. And not because of his acting talent or lack of it or anything else, just his presence and what he means in a film was exactly the wrong, the worst kind of casting for that character who was supposed to be a, a, non, a mousy, kind of anonymous little guy. And uh, um, uh, it really went into the nature of human identity and how connected it is with memory. It's kind of terrifying to realize that what you are is totally dependent on your memory of your past. And that, that I mean, Bunuel's, uh, Louis Bunuel, the famous surrealistic, uh, surrealist filmmaker, uh, wrote a book called My Last Sigh. And he, sa he begins it with, a, with, with recounting the story of his mother who, was, who had lost her memory through senility and maybe even Alzheimer's diseases, we didn't know, um, who would read a magazine and put it down, and then a minute later pick it up again and start to read it again because she hadn't remembered reading it. She could read this one magazine forever. And he, it terrified him because he realized that she was no longer a human being because her memory had gone. She was no longer a person, and certainly not the person who had been his mother and whom he loved. And, he, and that's why he, in terror, tried to remember everything that he could about his past life and incorporate it in this autobiography. And I, there was something about that that was so touching and terrifying, that image, that that's really an essence, something of what the essence of Total Recall was for me. Right. Thank you very much, David. Take care. In Philip K. Dick's original story, future citizens take mental vacations by plugging their brains into a computer, let your mind wander on a dream holiday. But when one cybernetic sabbatical goes wrong, the hapless traveler is left questioning all of his memories. John Varley borrowed this idea of memory screw-ups during a techno trip, and he gave it his own spin in Overdrawn at the Memory Bank. And in his short story, The Phantom of Kansas, and his novel, The Okfuchi Hotline, Varley used breakthroughs in computer memory and cloning technology to allow people to be totally recalled. 
Another author who picked up on this idea is Walter John Williams in his novel, Voice of the Whirlwind. Basically, you download your brain um, into uh, uh, data storage uh, and uh, donate a bit of tissue. Um, and if your character dies uh, or kill, is killed in a faraway war or whatever, basically, they, they grow a clone and they implant your memories in it um, so that you're functionally immortal um, and you're pretty much up to speed as long as you keep renewing uh, your memory chip every so often. Uh, unfortunately for uh, the protagonist of Voice of the Whirlwind, his, uh, his character didn't do that, and when he woke up he was seven years out of date and discovered that he'd been divorced and remarried and divorced again and had various other kinds of adventures which had eventually led to his demise. How did those seven missing years affect this new version of Stuart, his beta clone? Well, I mean, he, f he felt a great wistfulness for the, as, as he had, his memories left him in a very happy place. And then when he woke up many years later, he discovered that, that, the, uh, that, the, that the life that he had believed had been so fulfilling had been based on illusion and that that life had been destroyed. And so he felt compelled both to um, discover what had destroyed it and, and seek to correct that in some way uh, and to seek to recreate life as he had wished it would have been. Um, and so he was compelled to go back and, 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 and contact his ex-wife, whom he last remembered being very happy with, um, and whose life uh, his, his alpha clone, or his alpha original, rather, had, uh, had essentially destroyed. In C.J. Cherry's novel, Heavy Time, the hero never even gets the chance to become happily married. Paul Decker and his wealthy fiancée, Corey, are out mining asteroids when their spaceship crashes, leaving him with a nasty bump on the noggin, a dead girlfriend, and no memory of what happened. Did Decker murder his future wife for her money, or is it all a sinister cover-up by the computer that oversees all space mining on behalf of the Aztec's mining company? You've had amnesiac characters at the center of Heavy Time and Down Below Station. Why does memory and its fallibility intrigue you? Um, how people perceive the universe is a very subjective thing. Um, people remember um, things that aren't even real events. Uh, there are many people that remember an incident far different from other people who witnessed the exact same incident. So each of us, in a sense, lives in a separate reality. How much research did you do into real-world cases of amnesia before attempting an amnesiac hero? I have observed cases of amnesia. I actually um, suffered one myself, uh, <laughs> very minor. But um, I managed to lose a few seconds of my life that I would really like to know what happened because I slipped and fell on a rainy street. And the last thing I remember is a car coming straight from my head. Um, the next thing I remember is running through a parking lot with keys in hand and putting them in the lock and getting into my own car. I had a nasty lump on my head. I have absolutely no recollection since I was among strangers. I have no way of recovering that. It has never come back to me. It's just gone. Um, memory is a tricky thing, and since it is really the, um, uh, the wall of our world, um, the screens on which we paint our individual experiences. It's, to me, always been an interesting topic. In talking with other authors about their stories on amnesia, I've been disappointed to discover that, unlike C.J. Cherry, a lot didn't do any research into the medical documentation. This is supposed to be science fiction, not General Hospital. I mean, just because the characters draw blank doesn't mean the authors should. Luckily, some writers do their homework. How accurate a portrayal of an amnesia victim did you and Marvin Minsky present in The Turing Option? Absolutely true. Anything in that book that, that's, uh, that is medical or scientific is bang on. You know, Marvin's a professor at MIT, and, and they, all of his friends are professors, and we went to biologists and doctors, and everyone there checked everything out, you know. It's, uh, in other words, uh, there was a, a very carefully planted bullet, a carefully planned surgery, and a rebuilding, and a rebuilding of a mind. When you think about it, it shows you how a mind is built up, how it works. So in the book, 
uh, I, interpreting Marvin Minsky's theories, tries to present the most complicated thing in the world, intelligence, as an adventure action novel. And uh, for those who wanted, who cared, could read the reality there, and if they didn't get carried away with how mine were, they could watch the story and enjoy that.